Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Natalie Bull. I'm Executive Director of the National Trust for Canada. Welcome to this session, uh, our, one of our bi-weekly gatherings of the heritage sector with today's conversation focusing on diversity, equity, and anti-racism. I, I want to stress these, these are not really webinars. This is, uh, this is a, a, a curated conversation about essential topics. And we've had a, a number of these conversations since the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And we, we really see these as a way to bring many voices together. Uh, we've got panelists here on the screen, but, uh, but all of you listening in uh, are encouraged to participate using the chat function. Uh, feel free to go ahead now and tell us who's joining us on the line today. Uh, and through the course of the session, please, please uh, do share any points or questions that you would like to make. Uh, or that you would like to have the panelists address. Uh, this is such an important and timely topic and I, I was telling the panelists I don't, I don't really feel that the National Trust is ready to to host this session in many ways but it's also a topic that we, we don't want to delay uh, talking about in a national forum. Shocking events in the news I think raising the, the, our consciousness globally. Uh, citizens are confronting history and heritage in the streets and, and more than ever I think challenging um, the the um, challenging street names and monuments that that hide or even openly reflect a, a dark history. Uh, I think the the emphasis more recently on Black Lives Matter and that movement is really a continuation of the truth telling that began in earnest in Canada with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. And so I, I think we would all agree that as heritage organizations as the operators of historic sites and, and as advocates who care about history and heritage, we all have a responsibility to be part of a movement for social change to create a more equitable and, and just and inclusive society. But how do we do that? Um, at the National Trust, we talk about sharing more diverse stories, including more voices. Um, we've adopted the truth and reconciliation principles and we're developing policies. Um, you've seen organizations release statements recently and, and make pledges that they're encouraging their members to, to sign on to. Uh, but really, what should we be doing? Are we ready? What can we do? Um, I, I was really struck by an article that appeared last week in the magazine Canadian Art called A Crisis of Whiteness in Canada's Art Museums. And I, I think it starts to talk about that, that issue of the, the power dynamic and the fact that uh, even if we pass policies and, and make statements and try to include more diverse voices, ultimately um, our, our system is, uh, has an implicit or an explicit white bias. So an important and, and complex conversation. Uh, I'm very pleased to have some wonderful panelists on the line with us today uh, who will be each um, sharing their thoughts from, from their own perspective. Um, and maybe we'll go to that panelist slide. So I'll introduce them very briefly and then encourage them to also, if they'd like to add a few words about where they're coming from to do that when, when they're uh, introduced to speak. We'll be starting today with Cody Grote, who is a director with the Indigenous Heritage Circle, a national Indigenous heritage organization that has become an important uh, and valued partner for the National Trust. Cody Grote is a Mohawk from the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory in Ontario, and he's done some really interesting work that he may refer to in exploring the, the evolving relationship between the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada and Indigenous Peoples, um, and has, has been published on the politics of commemorating Canadian residential schools. We also have Karen Aird, who's the president of the Indigenous Heritage Circle and a, a senior leader at the First Peoples Cultural Council in BC. Uh, Karen is a member of the Soto First Nations and Treaty No. 8 territory in BC and has worked in, in heritage and uh, worked as a consultant with historic places for more than 20 years. We also have Graham Nickerson, pleased to see Graham's face here. Uh, uh, Graham um, is a member of the New Brunswick Black History Society here in New Brunswick, uh, where I'm also speaking from, um, and uh, a graduate student at the University of New Brunswick. And Graham has done some really interesting work uh, volunteering with institutions in New Brunswick to help them develop material to express the Black perspective. We also have Beth Hanna. Beth, another uh, organization that's an important partner for the National Trust. Uh, she leads the Ontario Heritage Trust and has been working in heritage and history for more than 30 years. And so she brings her breadth of experience and also her organization's 
work in, in presenting historic places to the public and how, she, how she's um, led the organization in doing that in a, in a much more inclusive way. Also pleased to introduce Paul Gravett. Paul is the Executive Director of Heritage BC, a charitable not-for-profit organization that is leading an important dialogue in British Columbia about the value of heritage uh, and, um, and more recently uh, a discussion about anti-racism in, in the work of heritage organizations. So I think that's all of our panelists. And now I will introduce, I'll, I'll ask Cody to go ahead um, and, and open the discussion with a few thoughts and then we'll, we'll hand it on to uh, other panelists and then leave some time for discussion. Over to you, Cody. Thank you, Natalie. Hello, everyone. As Natalie said, my name is Cody Grote. I'm with the Indigenous Heritage Circle. I'm Mohawk from Six Nations of a Grand River in Southwestern Ontario. I'm calling this morning from London, Ontario and reading through some of the chat feature to see where everyone's coming from. I see that there's also some other people from London, Ontario. So I'm very glad to see that. Um, I was very excited to join this call today. My research, I'm currently doing a PhD in history at Wilfrid Laurier University and my research looks at the commemoration of Indigenous cultural heritage and history by the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, which is our current national commemorative body. But I've also worked closely with the Indigenous Heritage Circle, and I've really learned a lot this past year, and I think we have a lot of discussions that relate to these ideas of Indigenous cultural heritage, uh, relate to a lot of other themes that are happening nationally and internationally. One of the things that I'm really interested in as part of this discussion is obviously kind of the, the event in the news that was the impetus for this. And it's all about statues. And statues is a big point of discussion that um, a lot of people are having right now. And it's what, in my opinion, the general public is most aware of when it comes to equity, diversity, and inclusion in the heritage sector. And I'm just gonna start with a case study that I know really well because I feel it's something that can spark a lot of conversation. I did my Bachelor of Arts degree in history at Laurier Brantford, so their Brantford, Ontario campus. And right outside of our campus, there's a statue of Joseph Brandt. And I don't have any statistics, but it's one of the very few statues of an Indigenous person, of a named Indigenous person, a specific entity that exists in Canada. And it was one of the first ever statues of an Indigenous person that was erected in Canada. And we look at this and we think it's probably very innovative. It was erected in the late 1880s. But this statue of Joseph Brandt, who is a complicated figure and I'm not gonna get into that, it's right in the middle of Victoria Park, named after Queen Victoria. There's sidewalks that lead right into the middle of a park that are shaped as a Union Jack. So Joseph Brandt is standing right in the middle of a Union Jack. Other members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy are staring up adoringly at Joseph Brandt. This was erected not by an indigenous community, but by a white community who viewed Joseph Brandt as a ideal Indian. That was kind of, a, that was the wording that they used when they erected this. Um, he was a figure that was co-opted to achieve specific goals. And when this statue was erected, it was erected by, um, it was unveiled, sorry, by generals who were involved in the Northwest resistance, who were fighting against the Métis. They actually had one of the leading generals from that conflict formally unveil it. Um, and, and the language that they used was sort of saying that the Métis were a bad example of Indigenous peoples and Joseph Brandt and the Haudenosaunee were a key example of what Indigenous people should look like as strong and respectful allies. So that's a conversation I want to sort of throw in now because we have this idea that statues such as John A. MacDonald, um, Cecil Rhodes in other contexts, for example, these are both statues that need to be taken down. And I'm not saying at all that the statue of Joseph Brandt needs to be taken down, but it goes to show that every statue memorial in Canada has a really uh, complex, difficult, and confusing heritage that we need to look at and question as part of this, even in statues of Indigenous peoples. But I'm also speaking here today as part of the Indigenous Heritage Circle. And we are a national not-for-profit organization founded by Karen Aird, who's gonna speak later. But one of the things that I think is very important about the IHC and our approach is that we are an organization that tries to incorporate First Nations, Inuit, and Métis perspectives. And I feel that's very important to our discussion because there's not a singular Indigenous perspective. There's a lot of very complex uh, cultural policies and frameworks that are working within Indigenous communities. And that's another thing that the IHC tries to act on. We know that there can't be a single approach to Indigenous cultural heritage because every Indigenous community, even within the broad categories of First Nations, Inuit, Métis, have distinct 
uh, legal traditions and cultural frameworks that govern their relationship with their cultural heritage. And those legal traditions and cultural frameworks are going to impact how they want to see their heritage protected and respected. So I think that's really important for us to consider as well that when we're trying to be um, inclusive in our organizations, we can't just say, you know, let's bring in an indigenous person. We need to look at the community that they're from and understand that the community they're from is going to influence their specific uh, personal perspectives and the work that they do. I look at uh, how our organization is trying to uh, work and develop and operate. And one of the things that I realize is, you know, we have a very strong board of governors that, or board of directors, sorry, that includes First Nations and UMAT perspectives. But we also want to make sure that once we start formally staffing our organization, we also have a diversity of perspectives. And that's something that's really important for other national heritage organizations like Heritage BC and the Ontario Heritage Trust who are joining us today. One of the things I think of is how these organizations and other organizations across the country are doing a really good job of getting a diverse board of directors or board of governors that reflects um, you know, diverse perspectives that touches on these themes of equity, diversity, and inclusion. But it's also gonna be important to make sure that the staff is also diverse as well, because that is where a lot of the decisions are made in my opinion. It's not just the board of directors, that might be strategic vision, that might be overarching principles, but the staff are really working on the ground day to day and having those perspectives reflected is gonna be very important as well. Um, and one of the things that Natalie and I were discussing just before this call started and I was discussing with the others is that it's really important to make sure we don't just have racialized employees who are working in a position that tries to address racialized concerns. It can't just be a reconciliation manager. It can't be a repatriation officer. It has to be people who come from racialized or different backgrounds who are working in the day-to-day -day, uh, operational procedures of your organization and involved in almost every decision because that is where you're going to start to see institutional change as opposed to just cursory or, or surface level change. Um, I don't want to go too much rambling, so I think I'll probably leave it there and let someone else build off my comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Cody, for that great opening opening set of comments. Lots to come back to and unpack. But why don't we go quickly over to Beth Hanna as our second panelist. You're, you're muted, Beth. I'm Beth Hanna. I'm CEO of the Ontario Heritage Trust. Uh, and some of you may have heard me speak on this topic in the past. Um, I've been asking critical questions for a number of years about whose history we're telling, about gender, Black and Indigenous peoples, and people of color, uh, and the economically disenfranchised, and others whose stories have been overlooked or intentionally omitted from the authorized discourse. Uh, I've been talking about what we can serve and how those choices are made about decolonizing history and about building bridges of reconciliation and creating a sense of belonging. As a trust, we've taken steps to ensure that, uh, that we, um, that the work we do is honest and authentic and inclusive and that it addresses the diversity of Ontario. And it's been done intentionally, it's been done strategically uh, and with purpose. And it hasn't been a paper exercise. And that's been important for all of us who've been, who've been doing this work. We're working with communities across the province to share their own stories in their own voices, to celebrate the diversity of their experiences and their languages, their customs and perspectives, uh, to bring those uh, histories of different people and different places to the forefront. Over a number of years, we've made a concerted effort to bring uh, forward the stories of all the people of Ontario. So we've looked, we've provided a forum on our website to look back over more than 10,000 years and to invite people to share their own stories in their own voices. Uh, our goal is really to redefine the narrative, to expand that narrative, to ensure that the heritage we protect and the stories we tell are respectful and accurate and are authentic, and that they're a portrayal of the peoples who've lived on and contributed to the land that we know as Ontario, rather than a Western European perspective of what we should be valuing. 
So we've asked questions like, whose heritage are we protecting? Whose stories are we telling? What's missing? And the what's missing is the big question. Uh, we've designed programs and partnerships in recent years to create a meaningful dialogue uh, and a more inclusive, discu inclusive discussion. Uh, we recognize that there are entire populations of our society whose contributions to our history have been overlooked, either again intentionally or not. Uh, women, Black and Indigenous communities, people of color, immigrant communities and refugees, and the LGBTQ, just to name a few. So we've looked at our events and our publications, our websites, our exhibits, and our social media, and we've worked with communities across the province to share their stories. The, um, the work we're doing is designed to uh, be a more integrated protection uh, that, that brings together tangible heritage and intangible, uh, the tangible of place and object with the intangible of story and memory and tradition. Uh, we've had to consider at every turn whether there's another story to be told, whether there's another voice that needs to be heard. The work we do with Indigenous communities, and, and Cody, I do say that in, in the plural, uh, has been, it's been necessary to search uh, past, uh, past the well-told, long-taught history of the settlers. And I grew up in Brantford, so the Joseph Brant Memorial that you've talked about, I, I know very well to understand that complex and successful com uh, civilizations of the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat, the stories of the Métis, uh, and, uh, and to look at that 10,000 plus years. We've, looked, uh, we've worked with elders and knowledge keepers uh, to bring those stories forward and also to protect sacred land in partnership with, uh, with nations uh, to ensure that they, we have collaborative and co-managing uh, co relationships in the protection of those sacred spaces. At Uncle Tom's Cabin historic site in Dresden, Josiah Hansen's home, uh, we've recently been re-examining the reality of slavery in Canada so that we better understand its influence on what's followed. And we've looked at the Dawn Settlement as an example to explore themes of freedom and social justice. The provincial plaques have been an interesting discussion. Uh, we've been uh, putting up provincial plaques for more than seven decades. Uh, and they've been an important medium for us for sharing stories and, and uh, we've been working with communities, with elders and historians and leaders from communities all over the province to do those. But a couple of years ago, we, uh, we looked at all of our plaques, 1,284 of them, uh, to understand where the content and the terminology is outdated or inaccurate, incomplete or disrespectful. And so we've had to acknowledge that for many of the subjects that we've commemorated on plaques, the story we present is incomplete. Uh, it's a small part of a more complex topic. It may include language that is no longer acceptable. Uh, and so we've been uh, identifying resources to uh, expand the information we include on the website to share those broader perspectives. Uh, and we're now looking at a plan to replace uh, some of those uh, plaques that we cannot tolerate being, being there. We've also done an analysis of all of the properties that we protect, uh, either through ownership or easement. Uh, and when seen as a whole, the, the portfolio tells a really interesting story about the province, but there are gaps. And so we're doing an analysis of that, that broad portfolio to identify where the gaps exist. Uh, and then we'll need to be raising funds and working with communities to, in partnership to address those gaps. And we've been challenged to re-examine our identification and valuation processes uh, with respect to the sometimes dissonant layers of history and also the interaction between community and geography and to ensure that uh, what the, the criteria we're using to determine what has heritage value is in fact appropriate. Uh, and that we proceed in an approach that's inclusive and multifaceted and reflects our diversity and complexity. We still have a lot of work to do, uh, and, uh, and I'm pleased to be part of this conversation as we proceed together. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you very much, Beth, and I, I know you've had some really important partnerships with, with organizations that are, that are helping you bring those voices and those stories into the work that the Trust does, so I hope we have a chance to hear more about that. 
I'm going to invite Graham Nickerson to speak next. And while he's unmuting his microphone and putting his image back on the screen, I, I think I neglected to introduce my colleague, Chris Weeb from the National Trust, who is here carefully monitoring everything happening in the chat and the QA, Q and A box. Uh, and Chris, you're, um, I, I authorize you to interrupt when you see a question or something that needs to be directed to one of our panelists. So Graham, welcome. Hi. Um, yeah, my name is Graham Nickerson, and I'm working mainly as a volunteer in um, <clears throat> with a couple organizations here in New Brunswick and in Nova Scotia. And so um, as a member or a descendant of Black Loyalists, I am in sort of a unique position in which I am part of a colonizing community and the colonized. And so we are... We have a complicated relationship with the, um, the basically the, the power structure. And so we're really, our history has been marginalized and our, our areas that, that we, we consider important are, tend to also be marginalized in areas where um, there's very little access or if they're next to dumps, those sorts of things. So uh, it's um, so what we find our our issues now are really trying to highlight a new narrative of of the contributions that that the Black community has has made to to Canadian or pre-Canadian history. Uh, for example. So we have a, a museum in Shelburne, Nova Scotia, which is where I'm from. It's actually in Birchtown. And that is known to be one of the major sites of Black Loyalist arrival in Canada after the American Revolution. But it's only one of many other communities. And so addressing the Black presence in other communities or, or, or what would be considered white communities today, uh, like King's Landing, for instance, in New Brunswick, where Black history has only recently been introduced, but it's it's not entirely accurate. Um, but in in Birchtown, we're doing a fairly good job of trying to uh, deal at least with local Black loyalist history. But we're still challenged with an over, like uh, across the diaspora. Um, many of the Black Loyalists ended up going back to the United States after the American Civil War, which is something that is challenging to Canadians to, um, to sort of uh, accept in that once the war was over in the U.S., things were better in the U.S. for Blacks than they were in Canada. And so that's, a, that's one of those challenges that we haven't really quite... Um, approached yet in the larger the larger uh, context but a couple of the things that have through my own research and just like black history you have to dig through all the weeds and every now and then a black person falls out and you're like oh so just in the last uh, couple of weeks uh, through uh, literature research uh, we found a uh, Black Loyalist descendant or Black Loyalist who was on uh, on HMS Victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. And that person is not in any record, in, in any Black history records at all. Uh, there's a Black Loyalist from Liverpool, Nova Scotia, who was awarded the Medal of Honor in the American Civil War. And there's no plaque or any acknowledgement of that person, for instance. Uh, another, the 1845 champion, heavyweight champion of Australia was a black loyalist from Annapolis, Nova Scotia. And again, there's no indication of that person. So our problem isn't so much that we have, uh, like it's, there's not a lot of statues to tear down. <laughs> there's, it's our, our problem is that there, there is no acknowledgement of most of our people. I think the only, there may be a couple of like um, military people who like John Hall, I believe has a, a marker, but so it's, 
it's developing um, an alternative narrative that sort of reintegrates black history into the places where it belongs. And so places like King's Landing, which I brought up earlier, where there is now a black pit house in, a, in what is traditionally a white loyalist um, historic village, sort of challenges people to deal with what actually happened. So that's all I have, if there's any questions. Okay, no, that's really interesting, Grim. So that, that sense of absence being being missed out from the story and how do we how do we as as heritage organizations and sites find ways to to redress that and, and change our structures at the same time. So thanks, Will. We'll come back to you. Uh, and now I'd like to invite Karen Aird, uh, president of Indigenous Heritage Circle and uh, also a leader at First People's Cultural Council in BC to, to speak next. Good morning, everyone. It's morning here in BC. It's almost uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Tanse. I'm actually talking to you from Sequetmuk Ulu, which is the Sequetmuk territory in the interior of BC in the city of Kamloops. Um, and we usually like to begin in BC by acknowledging our territories that we're on. So uh, yes, and uh, our one office, I work with First Peoples Cultural Council, but our one office is in Kamloops territory and our other office is in Coast Salish territory in Victoria near Brentwood Bay. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here today. It's, a, it's an interesting subject. It feels like uh, it's been repetitive for many, many years. So I'm really hoping now we see some change. But um, um, I'm from Soto First Nations in Northern BC uh, from Treaty 8 territory. So really actually, actually up near the Alaska Highway and uh, we have quite a, a big community up there, but we have uh, a lot of neighbors and we've all sort of, we're all quite closely connected. Um, I'm the mother of four kids and I have my kids through my kids. I'm connected through the Kitsan, the Kutma and Sequetmuk uh, peoples as well. So I feel very privileged. Um, in BC alone, we have 203 different First Nation Indigenous communities and over 34 Indigenous languages. So uh, our, there's a lot of kinship connections and there's also, um, I feel like BC has, uh, has been really in the last two years really um, taken a strong approach to recognition and inclusion of Indigenous cultural heritage. So my work actually began quite a few years ago. I'm an archeologist and uh, I, I was actually, um, I, I left the field, although I'm still kind of loosely involved and have many friends who are archeologists, but I, be, I began to question uh, the ownership of artifacts and how we look at heritage. And I found it really frustrating actually to see this disconnect. So uh, quite a few years ago in 2014, I formed the National Indigenous Heritage Circle with three of my colleagues, uh, historian Julie Harris, um, Madeline Redfern from uh, Nunavut, as well as now Senator Yvonne Boyer. And to be honest, it was like the four of us coming together and seeing how we could make change. So we started the national organization and at that point it began, uh, began a really, um, you know, quite a few years of really educating people. It was a lot of education and a lot of advocacy work. And uh, I'm so thrilled to see now we have a strong board of directors and I'm actually going to be stepping down soon and, and just be in an advisory role because I have uh, someone like Cody who's going to be taking over for me and I'm very, very thankful for his, his energy, because <laughs> it takes a lot of energy to run a national organization. So uh, we're still going to be involved, uh, the founding directors, and uh, it's it's a, it's exciting times because we do have a great national board, and um, it's indigenous led. And uh, we have the same with First Peoples. First Peoples Cultural Council actually has been around for 30 years, and we're a provincial crown corporation, but we are indigenous led. We have. Um, uh, we have an advisory board as well as we have a board of directors for our foundation and um, both of those are uh, primarily Indigenous peoples from across the province and we actually uh, get all of our guidance and input from our board of directors. So. Um, it's been, uh, it's, it, I know that our organization has been really leading in a lot of the work internationally as well as nationally around language. And we hosted last year our first international indigenous language conference and had hundreds and hundreds of participants. And it was an amazing event and we've actually won awards for it. And 
Um, two years ago, we actually, even though Indigenous cultural heritage has always been part of the mandate of First Peoples Cultural Council, we actually have never had any funding for it. So two years ago, uh, we initiated sort of our efforts to start getting funding and I joined the organization and we were lucky to receive our first ever grant programs. And um, the grant programs were sense of place as well as micro grants. And we were able to offer 25 grants for $25,000 to 14 indigenous uh, organizations who were looking at how they could um, revitalize their indigenous cultural heritage, but even projects such as connecting through their legal traditions to the land and uh, working with uh, their own cultural heritage management teams to uh, you know, um, develop their own programs and policies. So that was a really exciting project. And at the same time, we, we were able to uh, sign an MOU with the Heritage Branch. And uh, through that MOU, um, we initiated eight, actually nine projects that were looking at decolonizing heritage. And one of them was actually First Peoples leading the work at looking at UNDRIP and seeing how we could implement UNDRIP. And the other one, and that's a, a report that will be coming out actually in another few months. And then another project we looked at was um, like a, a Barkerville and Bowron Lakes, which is a very well-known um, provincial site and historic site in BC. And looking at the history from this site and working with Lataco Denny, uh, we hired anthropologist Gretchen Fox, and she was able to go in and using the UNESCO model for cultural landscapes and working with the community, really uncover the story of those, uh, that cultural landscape. And I'm, I think to me, like, this is one of the most important topics that I, I really want to talk about is history and the lack of inclusion of Indigenous history and then inaccuracy of these, this history and how the, we need to really support Indigenous peoples in retelling this history. Um, and so this site was really interesting because they had said Indigenous people were no longer there and through this work we found actually they were a strong part of that area, that region, and, and they, uh, uh, there was a, a community connected to it as well as it was used by not just one but at least nine different Indigenous nations that were traveling through there as part of their seasonal round. So that, that's just a little example of the work that's needed, uh, the, the really important work that's needed to uncover this history. And it needs to be told by Indigenous people. Um, I've, t I've said that over and over again, and I really believe that. Uh, some of the other projects that we, we've done, well, with, with First Peoples and with the IHC, we've been very strategic knowing that we have to advocate. And so one of the ways that we've advocated is through writing. Uh, we've produced policy papers and the IHC wrote, or not the IHC, the First Peoples wrote a policy paper on the recognition and inclusion of Indigenous cultural heritage in BC. And we have 10 recommendations under that. So that's available online. Um, and we recently wrote a paper with Gretchen Fox as well on, I should also mention Angie Bain was involved with, and Gretchen Fox with the policy paper, uh, helping write it with me. But we've also written on living heritage because uh, living heritage is not protected. And for us, a lot of our heritage is connected to the land. Well, most of it's connected to the land and that is living heritage. And so uh, a lot of our sites have been destroyed and will continue to be destroyed, especially with climate change. Um, and so we need to really think strategic on how we're gonna protect these sites and the traditions that are connected to them. I think that work has, hasn't really even begun in a lot of places in Canada. Um, and that work actually has to be tied to, uh, you know, the work around legal traditions and the work around governance and even things like kinship and traditional tenure and the connection to these landscapes. Um, the stories, the objects that were associated with them. There's so many layers. Um, one site in particular in BC, I know um, Keeley Creek, which is up for a National Historic Site. Keeley Creek is the name of um, a creek that crosses through this major significant cultural landscape that has hundreds of pit houses. And if you look at the site, you think of this, this, you know, this name, Keeley Creek, but Keeley Creek is not the indigenous name of the site. The indigenous name is, is, is another name and that's all being documented in, in the oral history of the Statlian people. 
So that site alone, if you were to scrape back the layers, there's pit house, these pit houses were connected to ceremonies related to um, a secret uh, dog clan society and as well as trails and these uh, coyote rock markers that are a long route to other sequential territories. So that's, you know, that's, that site is really important and it has been up for a National Historic Site, but there's still so much work to uncover the Indigenous history and culture of this landscape. And I feel like that is one of the areas that Canada, the provinces, the territories and the municipalities really need to invest in. And I think they need to sort of uh, really think strategically, especially in this time of COVID, because Indigenous people have faced tremendous impacts from colonization and from um, industrial development, urbanization, from even farms have built, gone through our territory. So I feel like now more than ever, we need to really plan for how we're going to safeguard and um, ensure that our cultural heritage is going to be here for the future and, and for our, our children, because we all, we all know that how important it is to identity and to wellness. So that's what I'm hoping to talk with you about today. But I should mention, I am off in five minutes. I have another meeting. <laughs> I have I, I, we're, we're, it's sad that we're running out of time. I think this yeah. is the beginning of a series of conversations, but thank you so much for that, Karen. And I, I'm, the last panelist is Paul Gravette. And as Paul is uh, muting his, uh, unmuting his microphone and preparing to, to speak, I, I will ask the panelists who are able to stay, uh, hopefully a bit beyond our our end time in five minutes to, to be thinking about one, if there's one piece of advice you could share with uh, our, our listeners today who are, I think, largely coming from heritage organizations and historic sites. So can we, can we give some quick um, advice to, um, to share to those sites uh, before we close today? And over to you, Paul. Thank you so much, Natalie. Yes, my name is Paul Gravett. I'm the executive director of Heritage BC. I would like to start by saying, as an organization of provincial scope, we recognize that we and our members and the local history and heritage that we seek to preserve occupy the lands and territories of BC's Indigenous peoples. Heritage BC asks people to reflect on the places where they reside and work and to respect the diversity of cultures and experiences that form the richness of our provincial heritage. I will also say I personally work and live on Musqueam territory. Uh, so I thought I'll, I just have a few points to make. Uh, and this is more not so much about what we have done, but maybe a little more about our starting point and a, and a, a kind of point of view that we've taken uh, in this conversation. And it always makes me nervous to follow someone like Karen and Cody on, on a conversation like this. But uh, so about three or four years ago, we began to address uh, what we, we recognize the whiteness of the heritage sector in, in BC. And as an organization, staff and board, we're very committed to change. We um, have learned and we take the point of view that we must not speak for others, but we must uh, provide that space and place for others to speak for themselves and to be heard, uh, that others can express their opinions and experiences, and that it's our job also to, to listen to those and to respect those, not to try to justify or argue in, in any way. Um, we know the sector from work that we've done around the province. We know that in BC, the sector is very eager to break down barriers. Uh, we feel that we must lead by example and create the opportunity for the voices to be heard around the province. Uh, we have learned that this work is not easy and we're constantly examining and questioning our own decisions and our own actions. Uh, it is important for us to learn from others and from the actions of others and learn, all, of course, from our own actions. Uh, in this way, our work is progressive and iterative. It's, uh, it's, it's always incremental what we're doing and we're always trying to build upon what we have done in the past. More recently, we've had a lot of conversations, uh, email conversations in particular, about what is going on in the world uh, around racism and 
on our board, we have uh, Vincent Kwan, who is with the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Classical Gar Ch Chinese Garden. And uh, he sent an email uh, in response to a question I had. I asked, would he write something for our newsletter? And in a way he said, no, he didn't actually use the word no, but in, over many paragraphs, he wrote something that I thought was so wonderful, uh, expressing his own opinion, but I thought it really expressed how we think as an organization. And I'll just read you two of the paragraphs. His longer statement will be published in, um, in a couple, you know, in a week, I guess. So he wrote, I don't feel comfortable making a singular statement at this point. I know that in a moment like this, many community or organization leaders are asked to express their positions as a way to help add support to the cause. I often feel that the most powerful position to take is not just to condemn the conscious racism we see, but also to learn and to unlearn what makes us unconsciously discriminatory. This is not only a unique opportunity for us working in the culture and heritage sector to lead in this way of thinking, but this is also an opportunity for us to see our roles as both teacher and student of culture and heritage. When we see ourselves as both teacher and student, we can better accept what we don't know as much as what we think we do know. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Paul. So this has been a really interesting opportunity to hear from an, a number of organizations and perspectives about, about how as a sector we can be, can be part of a, a movement of change and better understand what, what, what does reconciliation mean? What, does, what, what is anti-racism? And uh, I, I think um, I, I may, as, as we're coming close to the end of our time, I, one, one personal perspective, I, I think, uh, for myself in, in the role uh, at the National Trust, uh, the, the, the most valuable um, investment I think of time has been in relationships and just getting to know people who are uh, people like Cody and Karen and, and more recently meeting Graham um, here in New Brunswick, uh, just listening and learning. We, we, we need those relationships. Um, it, it, isn't, it isn't about making a statement and and coming out, coming out with a, perf a perfectly crafted document. I think, I think it has to start with real relationships. Uh, Lorna Crochu, who's been a, a wonderful member of our Board of Governors as well, just the, the support and the advice from, from um, and these underrepresented uh, people that are so important to, to the story of our country. So I, I might just go around the table and ask um, if, if other panelists would like to share a, a parting recommendation or comment that would be um, useful for the organizations and the advocates listening today. Yeah, uh, Natalie, just to jump in on that, I think uh, Kay Elgy, just to reiterate what you're saying too, she was asking uh, from the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario's perspective about how to reorient, and I think, you know, Paul has talked about that with Heritage BC's efforts, how to reorient uh, organizations that have been traditionally kind of focused on settler architecture or the kind of the dominant narratives, how do you shift that position? I think Beth has talked about that, but it'd be great to hear from others as well. Natalie, I might just say to your point, um, certainly for us, it's been to listen and to ask questions. Uh, we, we try very hard to assume we don't know. Um, I, I hope most of the time we achieve that. Um, that's part of the unconsciousness part, isn't it? It's, it's, it's hard to know some of these things that we say, um, the intentions that come out when we don't mean them. One, one thing um, I would say is um, relationships, now that you mentioned, it, it takes a lot of time. And we, there's a sense of urgency at the moment, but I, I would also say, certainly from my experience, building the relationships does take a lot of time. And to come to a, a, a point of trust, um, respect, where we start to understand each other. And I, I think of one organization in Vancouver, the um, BC Black Awareness Society. We've been working with them very quietly and slowly over two years to build a relationship where we can um, bring them into the conference. Um, they have effectively been um, invisible uh, in, in, in what we might say traditional heritage. 
And uh, we finally got to the point where we could bring them in to the conference and then the conference was canceled. Uh, but we continue to work with them and we'll be working with them in the fall. But that, that's about a, a two years of work. Mm -hmm. well, and I think we're conscious too that it, it's, it may be an investment of time on our part, but there is so much demand for Indigenous perspectives and and now for, for, black, for um, black Canadians to, to be part of this movement. And we have to be so conscious of, of their generosity in, in making time to, to, to be part of these conversations. So I had a few thoughts from all of this that I can share. Um, and one of them does touch on Kay's question about um, kind of a, a mission shift. And I think one of the things that's important to realize um, for organizations such as, you know, Heritage BCM and National Trust, and I know they're doing this, but look at how they're structurally developed and what the objectives of these organizations is and realize that those missions don't necessarily equate to how other groups, I'm going to speak from the Indigenous perspective, they don't relate to how we perceive culture and heritage at all. It's, it, you know, there's a whole sy systemic uh, change that needs to happen and I would like to say admittedly I don't think you know you'll ever fully make a change that does reflect those values you know a lot of these societies and organizations are built on dichotomies of uh, built heritage and natural heritage tangible and tangible these values or these divisions don't necessarily relate to the holistic image of culture and heritage that indigenous peoples or other groups have where language and worldviews and legal systems and are, are all tied to architecture and archaeology as well. Um, using an example of Ontario built heritage and Ontario architecture, I'm on the board of trustees for Chiefswood National Historic Site, which is the childhood home of poet Pauline Johnson. And her house, even architecturally, is very significant because it's, it's an identical house uh, on both sides. It faces a roadway and it faces the Grand River. And that was built intentionally to represent the values of a, of a white father and indigenous mother, sorry, indigenous father and white mother to show, you know, the significance of a river to one family and the significance of the roadway to another family. So ideology and worldview is intrinsically associated with this architecture from even the 1800s. But then it's kind of points that I would, would I hope to stress for organizations from this conversation, from other conversations I've seen is, sorry, I've written down notes. I'm just gonna look at my phone is first the important thing is to understand the role that the people you're working with have within their communities. So that's something that's very important for indigenous communities, especially. Um, and it all goes back to make sure you don't have, you know, a checkbox. You're not consulting a, a black Canadian, you're not consulting an indigenous Canadian, you're consulting someone who's aware of what's happening within their community and who has a role within their community that speaks to the themes you're trying to address. I think that's really important. But then also, uh, and I don't want to say this accusatorily, but don't don't rely on racialized people to give you the answers to what your organization needs to do. As Natalie said, it really does need to be a collaborative experience. And there is a big demand, and I'm sure Graham might experience this as well, to reach out to Indigenous people, to reach out to Black Canadians, to ask them what should we do, what changes should we make. But it really should be a process that is collaborative and that also you know, acknowledges and recognize these people for their thoughts and perspective, not just through a thank you, but through, you know, remuneration as well. If they're giving you expert advice and opinions on how to develop your organizations, make sure that those opinions are being, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be paid for it, but I'm just saying, you know, you have to acknowledge that this is time and experience that's going into these changes. And I think that's important to recognize moving forward. So that's a lot of thoughts and opinions, but I'll give it to someone else. Great, thank you, Cody. Graham, would you like to um, turn your screen back on and make some closing comments? Yeah, I would, it uh, seems natural that I follow Cody. Um, yeah, we're, I mean, we're really early in the game, the black community in Nova Scotia. And so we're, I mean, after we opened our museum in Birchtown and the fanfare sort of died down, you know, we lost three quarters of our board, right? When the Oh, we're done, we've got a museum. And then we have to run a museum and we have to hire people. And we're dealing with, um, when you, it's, we're still a community, we're a distinct people. So those people expect to see return on, on 
something that they perceive as theirs. And so we're, what we're dealing with now is learning how to, how to lead and how to, how to deal with HR issues. And how, like, and like Cody said, it's, you can't just hire black people because they're black. And we, we want, we have a, an institution that we now look and see that you know, we have ties with Sierra Leone and we need to develop the expertise to be able to run an international institution that ties Africa, the United States, Canada, England. And there's not a lot of people in our community who, I mean, we're really only a generation out from you know, black, a black community of very few people who ever attended university, for, for example. So we're, that's the challenge. And I think in terms of my experience in this journey, it's that sort of thing that, you know, when you buy a car, you, you have to, you have to buy the tires every, every year too, and you have to main, maintain it. And we're, we, I don't know how much of that was considered in after obtaining a museum and those sorts of things. So I think really with collaboration, that's what we need is, is this worldly experience with, with international venues that, to, to guide us to how we make this site really appeal beyond our local community. Right, no, thank you for that. And, and I think increasingly the the established institutions need to be part of, of sharing sharing the resources and the, the funding to make all of that possible. So Paul, did you have a closing comment? You know, I don't know if I can add more than what has already been said. Um, I, I think we do have an op, th th there's a great opportunity before us right now. And uh, we must not fall back on this opportunity. I, I think that can be said for a lot of situations right now um, through the discussions around racism, through COVID. Um, there are many opportunities that have been put before us and we need to seize these opportunities and to move forward to recognize that there are, there are different ways to do things. And so I, I thank you, Natalie. I know what it's, you started off by saying it's, um, you feel for the trust, it's, it's, it's um, you're sort of put in the, it wasn't your words, but putting yourselves out on a limb. And I feel like we do that all the time. Um, you know, I, I have to say we're, you know, we're a fairly white organization. Um, we do have um, some representation on the board, but we have a very, very long way to go. And we're very cautious on how we do things, but it is our responsibility to, to take this forward. And when we, when you asked me to be on this because of something we had put in our newsletter, um, it, it's, it's scary. That, that was scary putting the, that information out there into the public and what kind of reaction we might get. But those are the steps we need to take. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I had similar advice when I, when we, the, our organization first started talking about reconciliation and someone said, just make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes, but you've got to, you've got to reach out and be, be part of this, uh, this conversation. And I think we, we all in this field want heritage and historic places to be relevant and to be, to be part of what's, what's really uh, essential and important in society. So this, this, is, this is maybe the most important thing we can do right now. So mm. I, I would invite Chris, if you had anything you wanted to say about upcoming conversations that we're planning for the National Trust online conference in, in the fall that will further this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. No, we're trying. We're building in um, some substantial pieces within the conference uh, that that will will we'll look at some of these uh, dimensions around diversity, from you know from uh, positions of race and ethnicity and class and gender, uh, religion. So I think actually there's a main there's a there's going to be a main um, joint plenary that's going to look at that uh, with some of the some uh, key figures talking about that whole kind of uh, question. And I think what's interesting is someone, I think it was um, Cody or Karen was talking about the systemic nature of it. And I think that's one of the unexamined parts that the, um, the kind of the preservation or the heritage conservation community is going to have to deal with is how are some of the fundamental ideas we have around um, 
you know, uh, core ideas we have around property designation or how we recognize heritage and how that's complicit in, you know, kind of uh, own property ownership, naturally exclusionary. Um, you know, how do these practices kind of uh, work to perpetuate those kind of privileging of, um, of architecture? How does architectural value and our, our, our kind of uh, interest in material conservation and authenticity, how does that also kind of uh, perpetuate injustice? So I think these are just some of the things that we're sort of wanting to explore uh, at the conference and uh, take it a bit further because I think that's on the kind of on the horizon of the of the conservation and heritage community and uh, really needs to be addressed. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. So uh, with that, I think we'll close today's session. Sorry, we're keeping you a bit longer than we intended, but it's uh, it's really just we just, I think, scratched the, the surface on this this important conversation. Uh, I urge uh, everyone on the line uh, to, to join us again in two weeks. We have these regular bi-weekly gatherings of the sector uh, every Tuesday at um, 1215 Eastern. Uh, so, so go to the website and register. I think uh, we've just sent out the link again to make it easy for you. Uh, we will share the recording of this session and uh, as well as the chat and Q&A record. So none of that will be lost and we'll, we'll uh, go back and look at it all with interest ourselves as we, as we map out steps forward. So thanks again, everyone, for being part of this conversation. It's, it's the beginning. Thanks, everyone. Merci et bonjour. <laughs>